Hello. This lecture is a continuation of the last one, not so much concentrating on history, but on what it means to learn Latin. And just by virtue of being a speaker of modern English and taking part in contemporary Anglophone culture, you are more than likely already familiar with some Latin, or at least some sayings that have been translated into English from Latin. So just in our everyday writings, we'll use abbreviations like PS, which of course means postscriptum. That is, it's something you write after a letter. Now, this is a little obsolete now, not with the advent of email, but we still use it, PS, or EG, which stands for Exempli Grata. That is, for the sake of example, it's what you use when you want to give an example of something, or IE, which is id est, which is literally, you know, that is. It's what you say when you want to expand on something further. And people get these two confused a lot, by the way. That is EG and IE. Uh, and, but now that you know what they actually mean, it's, it might be easier for you to keep them straight. And that will give you an advantage over other writers. Some other phrases you might use in philosophical discussion are things like, you know, what we have here, caveat emptor or lector, which is caveat is let the whoever beware. May, may the person beware. Let the buyer beware or let the reader beware. It's what you say when, well, you're selling a used car, maybe, or when you're making some, a writer is making an assertion he's not quite sure of. Then there's one of our favorites, which you'll probably see on the bumper sticker, carpe diem, that is, seize the day. This uh, uh, command here, carpe, seize. Or then there's the famous cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, from... Descartes, another, another, uh, oops, I'm running out of room here, therefore I am, and this here is Descartes right here, uh, 16th century, or seven, excuse me, 17th century French philosopher, and then there's everyone's favorite, in vino veritas, in aqua sanitas, this is the, the lesser known, uh, in aqua sanitas is the lesser known continuation of it, uh, that is, in, in truth is in wine, sanity, or health is in water. There are a lot of political phrases in, that you might know in Latin that we use today. For instance, our national motto, a pluribus unum, out of many one. Then there's other political phrases like Pax Romana, or the Pax Britannica, or the Pax Americana. That is the Roman peace, or the American peace, or the British peace. Magna Carta is a big one. That's this right here, Magna Carta. That is what King John signed and apparently went mad afterwards. And then there's other phrases like Vox Populi, or Vox Dei. Just some phrases you might know. And other than these, we just have a lot of words in our general vocabulary that are derived from Latin or very similar to Latin. In the first video, I mentioned the word narrate. That's the Latin verb narrare. But there are a lot of common English words you can think of that are Latin or derived from Latin, namely like maybe, maybe monitor, honor, memory, perception, delete. The device on which I'm recording this is called a computer, which is from the Latin word computare, that is to compute or to reckon. Or you might be watching this on a tablet, which is again also derived from Latin, the word that is. So do these words have anything in common? It's hard to say because there are so many of them. But my general impression is that words that we take from Latin tend to either have something to do with technology or they describe more abstract ideas, whereas English words of Anglo-Saxon origin are usually for more concrete things, or maybe emotions too. Indeed, even if there are a lot of Latin words in English, you can go through your day using mostly Anglo-Saxon words because common everyday objects tend to have native English names. If we take the example of biological terms, by the way, the names of muscles and bones are often Latin, that is, your femur, scapula, the pectorals, etc. But the visible body parts are mostly Anglo-Saxon. Head, shoulder, arm, finger, those are all Germanic words. A lot of high-tech tools have Latin names like computer application, like an app, program, airplane, whereas lower-tech tools have native, native English words or Anglo-Saxon words like screwdriver, drill, knife, and so on. The funny part is that none of those higher-tech inventions existed in Roman times, but our high-tech and scientific vocabulary is so inundated with Latin words, we tend to draw on Latin vocabulary or, or ancient Greek vocabulary in, in, in some cases when we need to label a new invention. And we've been doing that for several hundred years at least, so that means we've built up a lot of Latin vocabulary. Now, continuing on here, we all have our own reasons for studying anything it is that we study, and that goes for Latin too. 
you might be perfectly happy just getting a semester or two of basic Latin, and that's worthwhile. Latin is a logic game and it will improve your vocabulary. I just, I, in fact, I'd say it just makes you plain smarter. Look at me. But in case you want to go further, there are, to my mind, three basic steps. There's the step we're working on right now, mastering the fundamentals, that is, textbook Latin. As you already know, we're using Wheelock's Latin. This text is light on medieval, renaissance, and neo-Latin authors, but it still makes use of adapted classical Latin, and that's a good idea. It makes the bridge to unfiltered Latin texts easier, and that's when I, when I say unfiltered Latin texts, I mean mostly additions here, learning to read Latin in additions. Now, what is an addition? When I say addition, what I mean is a modern presentation of an ancient text. It's not quite the same concept as the second edition of a contemporary book. A modern author might publish a book and then make some changes or rearrangements or some additions and then publish a second edition. Or the publisher might be just trying to thwart the used textbook market so as to make sure impoverished students have no choice but to pay a premium for the text required textbook. But an edition of an ancient text is something different, because you can't consult the author of the ancient text while trying to re reproduce the text accurately. So the editor of a work will try to present the work as best he or she can without consulting the author, because that author is long since dead. But where did the editor get the work? Well, that brings us to step number three, which is learning to read Latin in manuscripts and inscriptions. So, again, where do you go to find the, the writings of an ancient author? Where do the additions come from? For that, you, need, you turn to the science of paleography. I'll write that here so you can see it. Paleography. Pick any spot on the board here. Now, even if you don't know the term paleography, you may see the Greek word paleo here, which means old. It's also used in terms such as paleolithic, right, the old stone age or more contemporarily, the paleocon as opposed to a neocon, neoconservative. Then there's the graphy here, this part here, which is from Greek, which means writing. So paleography is the study of old writing, old manuscripts and papyrus scrolls. Now, ancient Romans wrote on papyrus scrolls for the most part, which is made from reeds that grow in Egypt. The codex, that is a book that we would recognize that you know, opens up. That didn't really become popular until the fourth century, and the pages are typically made out of vellum, that is, deerskin. Vellum is pretty tough material, and, uh, oh, I skipped this one. There's all this too, additions. Here we go. To, uh, here's an example of a, of the, it's the Codex Frisingensis, a 7th century vellum manuscript. And you can see it's held up pretty well for being from the 7th or maybe the 8th century. The dating on this one's not quite entirely certain. It's the, actually the New Testament here. You can see it down here. It's the uh, first chapter of the Gospel of John. So you see vellum is, uh, that is deerskin, is, is quite tough. It's good stuff for this stuff. Papyrus, by the way, I'll move on a little bit. You can see this, this is a, an example of a, of a papyrus scroll, and you can see it hasn't held up as well. Of course, it's much older still than that vellum manuscript, but it, papyrus, it's, it's uh, just not as tough. It's, it's made, as I said, from the reeds that grow in Egypt. But just to go back to the vellum manuscript, vellum, as I said, is pretty tough, but they weren't around during the golden age of Latin literature. In the Golden Age, again, they use these papyrus scrolls, and papyrus isn't very durable. Scrolls, in particular, tend to wear out quite easily with use. That said, papyrology is a real thing, and you can look up some papyrus scrolls online if you like. I'll include a link for your browsing enjoyment on, on the D2L uh, site. You'll see that you have to be a real expert to be able to read and make any sort of sense out of these things, that is, of a papyrus scroll. It doesn't take a whole lot of practice to read this. Uh, you can see this is pr pr pretty legible, even on this kind of, you know, uh, bad reprodu electronic reproduction. Anyway, there's the papyrus scroll again. For the most part, though, if we want to get to, since the papyrus scrolls uh, don't hold up very well, that is, the papyrus scrolls from the golden age of Latin literature, for the most part we have to go to medieval manuscripts, which, compared to ancient papyri, are often quite legible and in relatively good condition. It really only takes a little practice to start reading well-preserved manuscripts from the Middle Ages. But medieval manuscripts were, of course, copied by hand much later than the original text was written. So they are copies of copies of innumerable copies. And when I say innumerable, what I really mean is that you just can't say 
say for certain how many times a particular manuscript has been copied before the surviving versions that you have were copied. And as, as we all know, when it comes to handwritten copies, mistakes creep in, reduplicate themselves, and pretty soon you can't be sure if what you have in the manuscript is what the author way back when actually wrote. Paleographers have ways of dealing with that, but we won't go too deeply into that now. The main point is that if you're interested in ancient writing, you're ultimately relying on medieval manuscripts, which means that you're relying on the tastes of medieval monks. If the monks who were responsible for copying ancient texts weren't interested in a particular text, that text didn't get copied. And over a couple of thousand years, that text might be sitting in a library shelf, and there it's going to rot, burn, get eaten by worms, sustain water damage, or possibly get erased and used for something else. An example of that last issue, one of, one of uh, Cicero's books was thought to be lost, but then it was discovered that some monk had done his best to erase Cicero's text so as to reuse the vellum for a different work. That's pretty common, because writing materials were very expensive, so they got recycled. But nowadays, using ultraviolet light, some clever scholar was able to rescue that text from the grave. Now, there's an idea that the church actually worked to censor pagan works. Maybe you've heard that, maybe you haven't. I'm sure there were some instances of Christian zealots uh, burning pagan books, but that's not really the reason a book might get lost. The real reason is just plain old neglect. If the monks weren't interested in copying the text, then the, that text would disappear eventually. That is, it would get burnt, eaten by worms, and so forth. And it's and it's hard to understand their choice sometimes. In the Confessions, St. Augustine praised a work by Cicero called Hortensius. That book is now gone. We only know about it because of St. Augustine. And you would think that if St. Augustine praised the work, the monks would be interested in copying it, but apparently they weren't. On the other hand, we have copies of Catullus's borderline pornographic verses. If I were an abbot, I wouldn't have my monks copying that stuff, but somebody was interested in it because we have medieval copies, and that's why we have Catullus. So that's the end of the introductory material, that is, the introductory videos. These videos are just a few things I wanted you to be aware of before we start. If you're going to learn French, you'll want to know where you can go and speak some French. You know, France, parts of Africa stuff like that. The history of Latin and how it's used and learned is uh, it's fascinating stuff and I just wanted you to have a little uh, have a little background before we start. Now on to learning Latin.